Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about labeling and reintegrative shaming theories. Now these theories are um, theories that people tend to remember because they're fairly simplistic um, theories and theories that people like a lot. We'll see at um, the end of the lecture if you continue to like them, but uh, people seem to really like uh, these theories. So we're going to start off talking about labeling theory. And labeling theory kind of focuses on these stigmatizing labels given to offenders. Um, interestingly, um, labeling theorists, depending on how they study labeling, um, make labels either the dependent or the independent variable, right? The dependent variable may explain why certain behaviors are socially defined as wrong, right? And so it could be, uh, for example, right, like you might hear people um, say stuff, and this isn't really the case anymore, but when I was growing up, it was when everyone was wearing really baggy pants that would hang down, you know, lower than their hips and stuff, they were low riding and all this stuff, and people suddenly started saying, well, look, this group of people tends to dress this way, we don't like this group of people, so we're going to pick on the way they dress, or whatever the case may be, you know, kind of a kids these days kind of thing. That's where the label is more the dependent variable. Um, the independent variable, however, um, hypothesizes why people commit crime. And it's this independent variable of, of the label that matters more, uh, at least in this class. So what's really interesting here is um, the labels are not nearly as important as who applies the label. So again, the basic idea of this theory is how people are labeled affects their behavior. But the labels are not as important who, as who applies them, right? So for example, usually it's powerful ruling elite that give people labels, and it's used to keep the less powerful submissive. And what are some examples of people being labeled, right? Um, you could argue right now, especially with the way things are going in society, a legal immigrant is a label, right? Now, that's something that conservatives label um, people crossing the border illegally as, but what is it that liberals tend to label people crossing the border as? They don't call them illegal immigrants, do they? They don't call them aliens or illegal aliens. They just call them immigrants or undocumented immigrants, right? And so they, there's that subtle difference between illegal immigrant and undocumented immigrant that is important because it changes the label to an extent, right? And so um, basically the idea here though is that the label does only matters if it's from the people in power. So Donald Trump calling uh, illegal immigrants illegal immigrants is what matters. It doesn't matter if me, I in class call them undocumented immigrants because I, I'm not powerful or I don't rule anything. So labeling in general is, again, based on this idea of symbolic interactionism. And we see this continuing to pop up in other theories, right? These symbols interacting with each other. And um, an individual's uh, identity and self-concept are seen as existing only in the context of society acting and reacting in social interactions with others, right? And so the reason I'm a college professor, right, and the reason why you all treat me like a or, or uh act as if I'm your college professor is because everyone treats me like a college professor. I walk into the classroom and I stand in front of the class, right? I wear a shirt and tie. You guys all sit in the audience, right? Uh, or at desks. Um, and there's this kind of um, context of society acting and reacting in these interactions with each other. And so every time I come into class and stand in front of the classroom and lecture, and every time you come into the class and sit at the desk to listen to me lecture, reinforces this label of me as your professor, right? Um, that's also why, just in general, not only with professors, but with coaches, um, with parents, maybe you're starting to change this with your parents now, but, but that's why professors don't go out to the bar or go to the club with college students, right? This is why coaches don't go out and party with their athletes, because they want to keep the context of their relationship the way it's supposed to be, right? This is why in the military, officers and enlisted men don't fraternize, right? Because... There is a power dynamic between professors and students, between parents and, and children, between officers and enlisted men, between coaches and athletes, that they want to keep. So all of the interactions, they want to continue to reinforce, I am in charge of you. And so because of that, we do things to continue to reinforce that, right? And so there's this idea of kind of the looking glass self. Our own self-concepts are really just reflections of others' conceptions of us according to labeling theory. We become what we think others think we are, right? Which is a super complicated uh, uh, sentence there, right? But basically, if everyone treats you like a nerd, 
you're going to start acting like a nerd, which is going to cause other people to continue to treat you like a nerd, right? Or even if you just think people view you as the nerd, you are going to act in that regard, right? And we see a beautiful example of labeling and symbolic social interaction right here. We've all seen Mean Girls, right? So we have Katie Heron here on the left-hand picture who initially comes to the school, meets um, Damien and uh, the girl, other girl whose name I don't remember now, um, and starts hanging out with them until Regina George and her friends all say, oh my God, you're really pretty, you should sit with us. Right? She's as at the beginning of the movie, and you can see here in this left hand picture, she's supposed to wear pink. She doesn't own any pink, so she ends up borrowing one of Damien's pink shirts because she isn't really doesn't fit in that quote unquote plastics label, right? But as the movie progresses and as people start treating her like a plastic, even though she initially went in to kind of um, infiltrate the plastics and take them down, she eventually, as everyone keeps treating her that way, becomes a plastic, right? A quote unquote plastic. Now, yes, you guys are all probably sitting in uh, your houses right now judging me for even using this example, but regardless, it's this beautiful example of labeling as a symbolic social interaction that takes place. So there's this also this self-fulfilling prophecy that's set in motion when uh, when we feel someone has labeled us, right? And so we start, someone labels us, uh, we, we feel that label, we start acting on that label, and then slowly we become more and more what that label is. So the label has power according to labeling theory. Um, terms like criminal or drug addict cause individuals to act in that way. And so the major proposition of labeling theory and what makes it different, that says wrong, but you say from any other theory, is this idea that the sanction actually causes more crime, right? Putting you in prison Call, labeling you as a criminal or as a felon or whatever that may be, uh, as a drunk for for driving drunk, causes you to commit more crime uh, in that in that regard, right? If everyone associates you as the person who's always drunk, right, in your friend group, let's say you are you or someone you know is the person that's always drunk, then whenever you guys go out drinking, there's probably a lot more social pressure for that person to drink more. Hey, last time you took 10 shots, tonight take 11. Ha ha ha, it'll be hilarious, Right? then that person ends up acting out in that way. And that's the basic suggestion of what labeling theory says happens. Now, the label as the independent variable is interesting, right? Because the person becomes what the labeling process was meant to prevent, right? And so there's this interactive process where the label and self-concept are constantly being formed and reformed. So some view the theory as one way, which is not really what we're suggesting here. It's the label and self-concept are constantly being formed and reformed in every interaction, which is also why in some friend groups you behave one way and in some friend groups you behave another way. And it's really weird when those friend groups get together, right? Because one might label you a partier, but then your Bible study or something might label you as a good, wholesome person, right? Um, however, it's true that the theory states subsequent deviant behavior is a directly uh, is directly affected from the labeling experience, right? So the theory doesn't say that the label must cause deviance, just that the label is going to push you more toward deviance, which is um, important. Now, there's different types of deviance, primary and secondary deviance, right? Primary deviance are uh, law violations that are unorganized and inconsistent, right? And without societal reactions, the deviance would probably just kind of stay this way. So if you think about it, right, a lot of people you went to high school with, or even maybe you in high school, maybe you drank a little bit underage, maybe you smoked a little bit of weed, but it was kind of sporadic, it was only kind of on special occasions, it didn't happen all the time, and you never got in trouble for it. And so now you probably, maybe you still dabble in it a little bit, but you don't dabble in it all that much. That's not really what labeling theory is interested with. It's the secondary deviance that's more interesting. It's this more, more, more coherent and organized deviance. This is deviant behavior that they would not have otherwise committed without the label. So let's say you're the same student who drinks occasionally, does, you know, smokes a little bit of weed now and then, maybe takes an Adderall during exam week, but you get caught. You've now been labeled by your family, friends, and most importantly, by society or the people in power, the judge, the system, as an alcoholic. So people are now going to start treating you as if you're an alcoholic, right? And then this more coherent and organized deviance develops. Now, major labeling theorists claim that they were never attempting to make a theory. 
And that's in large part because the empirical validity of labeling theory, which we'll talk about in the next couple slides, is really weak, right? However, the original publications, and this is one of the things that's always hilarious about theorists. We talked about this with Travis Hershey and, and labeling theory falls uh, guilty of this also. They forget they write stuff down in journal articles where they propose a theory called labeling theory. But then later on say, whoa, 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 we never said we were making a theory. We just said that a label matters and then we should look at labels, right? And it's like, well, you know, really 20 years ago you said this was a theory that you were proposing. Um, and so critics of labeling theory say it's way oversimplified, right? which is a valid concern. If you're listening to this, you might initially be liking this theory and saying, yes, this makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't account for primary deviance and ignores factors that influence primary deviance. If the interesting thing we're worried about is why do people commit crime, but we're ignoring the first several crimes they commit, well, that's not really all that great of a theory then, is it? If it's like, oh, well, the reason they keep committing crime is because they're labeled, well, that doesn't help us stop people from committing crime, right? Because people are still committing crime beforehand. It also focuses on powerlessness of those being labeled to resist the label. My father, and I can't remember if I've given you this example or not uh, in previous lectures, but my, my father always used to say to us growing up whenever uh, we would call each other names and my brother, sister, and I, and we would get upset about like, oh, Josh called me this or Brian called me that, um, was my dad would say, you're an elephant, it's like, what? No, I'm not. It's like, right, so you're not an elephant, so you're not an idiot either. Who cares if they call you an idiot, right? You can actually pretty easily resist labels that you've been labeled. Believe me, I was a male cheerleader for a while, and I got labeled all sorts of things that weren't true. Um, further, deviant acts create the label. The label doesn't create the deviant act. The only reason you're getting labeled, and especially officially labeled, right, the only reason you're getting labeled is because you've done something wrong, Right? And so if you've not done anything wrong, you're not getting labeled. And so the label is really the dependent variable, right? In the sense that it's, or not the dependent variable, it's, it's, it's really what's happening. It's the result of the crime you've committed, right? You don't get labeled without committing the crime first. Because of all of this, there is very little empirical validity to labeling theory, right? I hate to ruin it for you. I know a lot of people leave intros saying, I am a labeling theorist, and then they hear this and they're like, oh, well, I don't like that. Um, but first, the theory assumes that primary deviance is sporadic and not serious. Only labeling the person causes the behavior to become more serious. But there are some people that like start off committing murder. What about that? Um, you... Uh, Let's say I, I walk in, I'm, I've never killed anyone in my life, by the way, and I don't really ever break the law. Let's say I walk in on my wife, um, I perceive that my wife is uh, in the process of getting raped by somebody, and so I uh, beat, beat the guy over the head with a hammer because uh, he's raping my wife, and then I find out, my wife says, why did you just kill my boyfriend? I don't like that, right? Well, I'm probably getting ready to go to jail for murder, right, uh, in some capacity, maybe manslaughter. That's going to be one of the first crimes I've ever committed. I'm not, I've not yet ever been labeled a criminal for anything. How do we explain that? Labeling theory can't, right? Um, <clears throat> and there are some people that just kind of go big or go home as far as deviance is concerned, right? Also, empirically, the label deters as much as it encourages deviant behavior, right? When social factors are held constant, labeling also completely disappears from empirical support. Because remember, labeling has to be done by who for it to have power the people in power. So my mom labeling me, that doesn't matter. My mom doesn't have any power over me, right? Other than she pays my cell phone bill. Um, so labeling deters as much as encourages deviant behavior uh, when it's officially done, but when you control for all these social factors of what happens, the label completely disappears. So what are the logical policy implications of labeling? Well, the first policy implication is diversion, right? We're going to divert offenders away from formal sanctions. Let's stop sending them to jail. Let's stop labeling them felons. Let's stop um, uh, doing things that make them um, more formally charged with something, right? There's also deinstitutionalization. Get people out of prisons, right? It's insane that, that some people go to prisons for some things they go to and then other people get let off, right? Uh, Bernie Madoff, right, even though he swindled millions of dollars away from people in a Ponzi scheme, is he really learning something? Is it really helping him to be in prison for 150 years, even so essentially dying in prison? Probably not, right? Basic drug offenses. If you're just sitting on the street corner smoking a joint and the police arrest you and you get convicted for that, is that worth going to prison for a year or two for? 
Probably not. So get these people out of prisons. Uh, decriminalize things. Why in the world are so many things illegal? Right? Marijuana grows from a plant. Tobacco grows from a plant. Right? Tobacco definitely is going to cause cancer. Marijuana doesn't. Why is one illegal and one not? Right? If anything, we've gotten them in the wrong order. Right? So decriminalize some of these stupid offenses that don't matter. Right? Uh, uh, pornography is another one, or not pornography, but prostitution, right? The only reason, uh, the only way you can guarantee yourself not getting arrested for prostitution is to video record it and upload it to the internet, right? That's how you get out of uh, hiring a prostitute because then it becomes pornography and then it becomes business, right? That's kind of silly. So let's just decriminalize prostitution and be done with it, right? It's not going to cause the moral degradation of society or anything else, right? Non-intervention. Tolerate some behaviors of minor offenses rather than punishing the behavior. If you slow down and roll through a stop sign, but you made a good faith effort to make sure you weren't going to T-bone some other car, let it go, right? Why pull someone over? Why give them a, a, a moving violation for running a stop sign for that? Just let it go, right? Because we don't want to label someone, according to labeling theorists, in this way. Now, again, these interventions and these implications empirically don't work, but that's what the implications are of labeling theory. So, um, like most theorists, right, once they start testing their theory and realize, boy, this has really, really weak empirical validity, that's not good, they don't just say, never mind, let's adopt a theory that makes sense. They say, we will fix it and make it better. And the way they chose to fix it is by making reintegrative shaming theory. So again, they didn't just go away due to this low empirical validity. They decided we're going to revamp the theory, and the result is this reintegrative shaming. So shaming is the basic idea of invoking remorse in a person uh, being shamed by others, right? So the idea of shaming is let's make that person feel bad for what they did. Now, there's two basic ways you can do that. You can disintegrate or reintegrate them into whatever they're doing, right? So disintegrative shaming, there's no attempt to reconcile the shame defender with the community. It's you are an asshole, I don't like you, you need to go away, you're a bad person. Disintegrative shaming. Reintegrative shaming, on the other hand, attempts to reconcile the offender to society. Listen, what you did was wrong. It really hurt my feelings. I'm not mad, I'm disappointed in you, right? That's basically that parents use that all the time, right? You might use that with your spouse. My, my wife, um, uh, used to work at a country club and consistently uh, if she, you know, she had to work late all the time because it just was what it was. If she had someone who was a talker, there, you can't just say, hey, listen, I got to go home. And so she might come home 30, 45 minutes late, right? The If if I got all mad and said, where are you? I'm worried sick about you. You need to get home. I'm so mad that you're late. That would not really, that does nothing to to fix the issue, right? However, if I say, wow, you must have really had a tough day. I mean, yeah, dinner got cold, but it's okay. I'm sure we can microwave it. Then all of a sudden, my wife feels guilty about being late. Like, wow, my husband did a nice thing and cooked me dinner. Um, I feel bad that I'm an hour late and that he's been waiting for an hour to, uh, to eat. I'm going to try my best not to be late anymore because I don't want to feel guilty like this for doing what I've done, right? Disintegrative, yell at you, all of a sudden put you on the defensive and makes you want to fight back. Reintegrative, I totally understand you're late, it's okay, I had dinner ready, um, it's probably not gonna be good anymore, but we'll we'll try and choke it down anyway. Suddenly it's, oh boy, I, don't, I feel pretty guilty about this, I don't wanna do this again because I don't wanna upset whomever, right? One of the ways, so an example or a visual representation of reintegrative shaming looks like this. So the basic idea here Right, this kid obviously lied, stole, sold drugs, and didn't follow the law. So his mom said, instead of beating him or anything else, I'm going to put him on the street corner so everyone driving past him is going to start treating him like a criminal. Right now, initially you think, boy, this sounds more like disintegrative shaming than reintegrative shaming. Right, that's true. But then what mom does at the end of the day is, did you like getting treated like that? I know that you don't steal. You're you're not a thief. You're not a drug dealer. You're not a criminal. So stop acting like one. I still love you. Come back into my house. Let me love you. Let me tell you how much I care about you. But I, if you keep doing this stuff, that's not okay. Then suddenly the kid's like, wow, I really didn't like getting treated like a criminal when I was standing on the corner having people screaming stuff at me. I'm going to do what my mom says. I'm going to listen so that I don't get in trouble. So under reintegrative shaming, the label will not have a crime-enhancing effect because the person's getting reintegrated into society. And they used variables from other theories to support this idea of reintegrative shaming, which is always 
excuse me, hilarious to me. Specifically, they use attachment from bonding theory and uh, differential association from social learning theory. But um, the theory has not been widely tested in its purest form because the theory has 13, quote, facts a theory of crime ought to fit, which makes it what? In no way parsimonious. If there's 13 different facts, like, whew, that's heavy, right? So, for example, crime is committed by young minority males. Uh, they're unmarried, low educational aspirations, right? These are some of the facts a theory of crime ought to fit, right? Um, so tests of the theory in this way have quite mixed results because of these crazy different facts that a theory of crime ought to fit. As far as policy implications, restorative justice is by far the most common policy implication of reintegrative shaming, although technically restorative justice way predated shaming theories for a long time, actually, right? The basic policy of restorative justice is confronting the offender with the consequences of the crime, but done respectfully. We're avoiding stigmatization and we are having a commitment to ritual reintegration. Have the person apologize. Have the victim come and say, here's how it felt when I was victimized. Try and restore those relationships and try and get people to sit down next to each other and, and really just talk out what happened, apologize, uh, have the offender apologize to the victim and, and let the, the victim know what it felt like, right? So for example, let's say I have a 75-inch TV on my wall. I don't. I think my wife and I should get one, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Let's say I have a 75-inch TV on my wall. Someone walks by my house, looks in a window, sees a 75-inch TV, and says, if he can afford a 75-inch TV, he can afford to buy another one, breaks into my house, takes the TV off the wall, and takes off with it. Now, right, I could sit down and say, hey, man, I wanted to watch the game this weekend. That pissed me off, right? And that's probably what the person who's committing the crime thinks. All he wants to do is watch stuff on his big TV because, you know, he's just some rich guy who's a jerk, right? Now, what happens if that 75-inch TV actually belongs to my grandfather who has since passed away and the only thing he left me after he died was this TV because he and I used to sit down and watch that TV together for the last three years of his life? Does the offender know that when he's breaking into my house to steal that TV? Of course not, right? He has no idea that... I'm going to keep that TV for the rest of my life. Now, again, this is a made-up story, but that I'm going to keep that TV for the rest of my life even when it's way outdated and not good because there's such a sentimentality to that TV that it doesn't matter if the you know TV completely breaks. I'm never going to get rid of that TV because that was the TV Grandpa and I used to watch TV with, right? And he's now stolen it. In a, in a restorative justice, reintegrative shaming approach, you sit down and you say to the offender, listen, I actually don't have a lot of money. I actually can't afford a 75-inch TV. The only reason I have one is because it's a gift, right? And that gift was really, really did mean something to me. And so it really upsets me that you stole that from me, right? This is, th there's also the same idea as far as commitment to uh, ritual reintegration. And this is slightly different because it's not criminal, right? But one thing people always say is I get so annoyed and so upset seeing people on welfare roll up to uh, the uh, grocery store, pull out their iPhone and their Louis Vuitton purse, and then uh, use their uh, food stamps to pay for groceries. So, okay, I understand where maybe that would upset you, right? Because you think that the government is funding their kind of um, misbehavior of, oh, you can't afford groceries, but you can afford a Louis Vuitton purse, right? Well, what happens though, right, if this person's mother had more money than this child did, and the mother bought the Louis Vuitton purse for her daughter as a gift because she wanted her daughter to feel special? Can we really judge her then for having a Louis Vuitton purse? Maybe not, right? And so that's the idea is to kind of put yourself in the other person's shoes, specifically the victim's shoes, and see, look, this is there's some real issues here. We're not judging. We're not saying you're a bad person for committing this crime. We're avoiding the stigmatization. But you need to understand how this relationship works, and then hopefully there's some way to restore the relationship. Listen, do you still have the TV? I'd really love it if you got my grandpa's TV back to me. I don't even care if it's got a little crack in it or anything else. I would just really love to have that TV back because it means so much to me uh, because of that. Or, listen, my wife doesn't feel safe in our home anymore because you broke into it. She wakes up freaking out in the middle of the night. Every little bump and you know knock she hears in the middle of the night scares the hell out of her now because you've broken in. Okay, what do you tell my wife to make her not feel nervous about this? You know, And so you can talk about these things and try and restore the relationships. Faith-based programs use a restorative justice paradigm a lot. If you ever go to any sort of church, 
um, groups, you'll see restorative justice paradigms being used, and it allows the offenders to be rehabilitated through biblical teaching, study, and community service with great success. Faith-based programs have seemed to work pretty well. They admit that churches have been using restorative justice initiatives for a long time. Most um, restorative justice people uh, will say, we kind of got this idea from faith-based programs. Bra Braithwaite's theory, even, is a secular version of popular Christian thing themes. You'll see stuff like, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Treat kindly those who treat you spitefully, right? So you see a lot of these biblical themes in the theory. It's just, Jesus isn't the one who said them. Braithwaite is the one who said them, right? Which, you know, we could also talk about Braithwaite's weird issues of comparing himself to Jesus. Um, and so you see uh, faith-based programs using restorative justice very, very well. But, of course, the, the problem with that is you can't force someone to adopt a certain faith, right? If they don't truly believe it, it's not going to work. As far as restorative justice also, many programs make no reference to the formal theory, although all policy is based on some theory. Um, they, a lot of them argue that it's just important to hold the re offender responsible, but to also restore them and their victims to the community. And these restorative justice programs should include the victim, the offender, and the community to make things right. So for example, right, you guys have all probably figured out, and if you haven't, learn from me, um, complaining to your parents about your significant other is never a good idea. Because your parents will always, always, always remember what they did to you. Even if it's not anything all that serious, they will remember it forever. If I called my mother up and said, oh my God, mom, Taylor hasn't done laundry in a week. I can't believe it. I promise you it can be 20 years from now. And my mom will say, well, yeah, but sometimes she doesn't do the laundry, you know. Always remember, right? Even if Taylor and I have moved past it, right? And this is obviously a hypothetical. But even if Taylor and I have moved past it, right? My parents would always remember that. And so the important thing with restorative justice is it's not just reconciliation between the victim and the offender. The community as a whole needs to also help make things right. So my brothers and sisters, my parents need to not treat my wife like she's some not laundry doing wife or whatever in this weird example um, that she is because that would not actually help in this case, my wife, or the offender, um, not continue to commit crime or not to feel sorry for what they've done, right? Because you can't continue to hold people responsible for their past sins forever and ever and ever, because otherwise, why not just com continue keeping them? At least that, or continue doing them. That's the idea, at least, behind restorative justice. So while the results suggest a much more cost-effective um, result from restorative justice, uh, Basic um, restorative justice campaigns have weak empirical validity at best. Not very, very good. Faith-based studies actually showed a substantial reduction in recidivism for offenders who regularly attended a Bible study, but the reduction only lasted for about three years, right? Whereas regular restorative justice didn't work at all. Faith-based programs worked, but pretty temporarily in the grand scheme of things. So, so the future of labeling theory, some suggest that the label matters in crucial areas of the life course, right? And, and we'll talk about life course theories later on in the semester, but um, the label can, detect, uh, can affect educational attainment, which affects employment and therefore deviance. And so if you think about it in general, right, my, my mother-in-law is a, uh, a school principal, right? And so she knows who the behavioral problems are, and they try to purposely not load up one classroom with all the behavioral problems, right? And so let's say they, they know there's three kids, um, just for easy names, Brian, Josh, and Amanda, that's my brother, sister, and I, Brian, Josh, and Amanda are all bad kids, right? We have three first grade classes. We have Brian, Josh, and Amanda. We're going to put each kid in a separate class. However, that label stays with you and the teachers are aware, hey, look out for Brian in your class because Brian is a bad kid, right? He's a troublemaker. Make sure he's, um, you keep an eye on him. So before Brian even steps foot in the classroom, the teacher has him in the front row in the corner so she can keep her eye on him and any little misstep she's going to nip in the bud because she's going to make sure that he's not a bad kid. Well, if Brian doesn't understand a concept in class and he goes to raise his hand, the teacher might think, oh, he's just trying to be disruptive. I'm not even going to call on Brian. He's so disruptive. Never mind. Right? And so that education, Brian genuinely wants to learn but can't learn. And so when he goes to graduate, he's not going to college because he didn't learn anything. Therefore, he's working kind of menial employment, potentially. Not everyone who goes to college works menial employment, and so don't take this that way. But he might get menial employment 
not be able to afford his bills, and then turn to crime, right? So there is some suggestion that the label matters within this life course framework, but it's kind of a moderator toward crime, not the direct cause of crime. So there's also potential that informal labels may have more empirical support, right? A lot of labeling theorists have said, well, the official labeling doesn't matter. We don't care about official labeling. We care more about these informal labels. For example, labels from parents, maybe labels from friends or peer groups. However, when we start to going down that road, does it continue to sound like labeling theory? Or is it sounding more and more like differential association, differential reinforcement, maybe something along social learning theory, right? And so it suddenly adapts to become a completely separate theory. And I've mentioned this before in the semester, and I feel like it's worth mentioning again. A lot of theorists, all of a sudden, peer association is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, predictor of deviance, right? And so, at least social uh, predictor of deviance. Obviously being, you know, like a young male is the best predictor of deviance. But um, social deviance, it's peer association. Right, so um, so at any rate, um, what a lot of theorists will do is they'll say, golly, I've got really weak empirical support. Let's throw in peer association. Let's throw in friend deviance. And then suddenly my theory has strong empirical support because that one variable is so predictive that it pulls along everything else with it. And so that's, that's kind of an, an interesting thing that a lot of theorists will do that some labeling theorists have done here. So anyway, that's all we're going to talk about today. And as always, if you have any questions, let me know and I will talk to you soon.